What's good, bro? How you feeling, man? Good, man. How about yourself? Man, I'm just, I'm hanging on, bro. I, I hear you, bro. Right now. I hear you, man. David, I know it's been a minute, but it's always good, man, chopping it up with you, bro, seeing oh, yeah. what you're doing so far. So right now, I cannot wait, man, for this conversation, bro, just to give out, you know, a free game, talk about your journey, and just, man, have, like, a good time, just like always. So. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It. Let's get it, bro. All right. Seely, man, you already know from state, we always had like a great time, African-American yeah. studies, sports yeah. journalism, bro. And one thing that I always admired was seeing you on your grind. Even when, you know, I was at the Signal, I would see y'all, man, on primetime sports. I'm like, yo, that guy, like, he's always working, bro. Like, I love it. I love it. Sealy, man, what inspires you to get started in journalism, get started, man, in TV, and to see you killing it on a consistent basis? All right, yeah. So um, I, it all goes back to the eighth grade, man, because – so I was playing football, like you know, you know, we we both we both played ball, and yeah. Um, I think at a, at a certain point we realized, all right, you know what? I'm not I'm not gonna be the next Michael Vick, like I, right. I, 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 I was like, yo, it's not gonna happen, bro. So um, for me, man, I got I remember I got hurt. I actually I broke my wrist, mm. and um, my I was basically out for the season. So I really spent I think after about let's see we played 10 games and I think I was only I was only active for like the first three or four maybe wow uh, after that yeah I was like I was out for the rest of the year so um what I do remember was I just talked a lot on the sideline bro like I just mm. talked a lot on that sideline and pretty much like a a after that point it was like all right I'm talking a lot and then basically I found out that there's a job that will pay you to talk about sports a lot so um, and my aunt kind of put me on to that because she, she actually went to Georgia State. Wow. And, and said something about a sports journalist. And I was like, I don't even know what that means. So I Googled it. <laughs> and when I Googled it, I found a definition. And I was like, oh, no, nah, this is lit. Like, I, I got to do this. Yeah. And then from that point on, man, it was just like, all right, I got to make it. I think, like, for me, you know, when you discover something and you just immediately just have this passion for it, that's really mm. what it was. It was mm. just it, – it's just this passion. And so all that hard work and everything – it's just it's literally just passion bro like it's it's just the passion and the love of the game and that and then and to want to strive to be great mm, rock with it and Sheely, man i'm gonna tell you something bro when i see you man when you post your content um the news and man even at state one comparison that i like for you is Stuart scott and i know Stuart scott is like michael jordan bro but right, right, right. bro, seeing you blend like hip hop references and you know bring blackness in a space where sometimes that we're not properly you know represented. You love uh, Dr. Umar, me too. And sometimes <laughs> it'll be people who who look like us, right? But right, who aren't right, really right. like talking for us. But every right. single time, man, that I see you, I'm so proud because you never switch up. So, bro, yeah. can you just speak um, on the importance as a young black man being right. in news and still talking about the culture, still talking about hip hop, yeah. and merging that with sports as well? Man, yeah. So it's you know we merging, I'm merging hip hop. I'm merging, I'm merging the gospel into it too, man. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. It's just, I, it's just me. And I think so. I read Stuart Scott's book, and, and one of the things I learned yeah. from the book was, um, Stuart, man, he he talked about speaking to to his people. Like, there's a large audience watching Sports Center, but there's a time where he wants to speak to his people, mm -hmm. and that's what he did. He spoke to his people, and so when he spoke to them you know, he made references that references that they would get. And it was more like, if you know, you know. And if you don't, yeah. all right, don't worry, then don't worry about it. And that's kind yeah. of the same thing, man. Of course, you know, I got to come up with that for myself. Like, okay, how would that work for me? Mm -hmm. And just incorporate that. But also not not oversaturating it just to be like, oh, I'm just the guy with all the catchphrases. Sometimes you just got to report the news for what it is. You know, you, can't, just, you can't always have some creative wordplay and everything. You know, especially in a season like this um, with COVID going on, there's times mm -hmm. where – you know, there's a there's a there's a time of the season for everything. You know that yeah. that's biblical. So there's a yeah. time where I can I can put all these little jokes in and I can do <laughs> this and do that. And there's a time where I just need to just talk. <laughs> so um, yeah. that's that, that's kind of it, man. And and you know, if you're not being authentic, then what are you doing? You know what mm. I'm saying? You got to be authentic. Like that's you real. you got to be. It's it. it People can tell when you're being fake. Like people can yeah. tell. Like that. There's no way that's how he actually talks. There's no way that's how he actually. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like there's no way if I saw this dude out at the store or at the mall or something, mm. or we were kicking it at somebody's apartment. He wouldn't he be talking like that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So why 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 fake it? You know. Yeah. 
Hey, I love that, bro. And shout out to my man, um, Amit Nath, friend of the show, bro. He killed it um, as well. And he said COVID got me fed up. So, Sealy, man, speaking about COVID, I know that that kind of threw off 2020 for everybody. Mm -hmm. um, as someone who's on the news, on TV, bro, how do you try to provide inspiration for people who's just going through it right now? Well, you know, I, I think, uh, and I kind of said it yesterday, um, I was on the way to a story and I was telling some other journalists, I was saying, hey, um, I said, this has been a, it's been a hard year. You know, we had COVID, of course, but before COVID, we lost, we lost Kobe. Yeah, so bro. You, we, you know what I'm saying? Like, we lost Kobe. So many people looked up to Kobe. Mm. Um, we lose Kobe. Kobe was the reason I wanted to be a Laker. As yeah, like a three -year -old. definitely, bro. Especially growing like, up in the 2000s. You already man, know that. Like, yeah. I was like three, four, five years old or whatever. So mm -hmm. I'm like, man, I'm going to be on the Lakers. Yeah. Um, and so losing Kobe and then COVID hits. And then um, it's an election year, right? So then, then you got an election year. Then you had everything that happened with George Floyd and Amon yeah. Aubrey. I mean, yeah. it was a lot. It was a yeah. lot to handle, man. And I think you have to really look at it and say, okay, you know, um, what what am I grateful for? What what do I have now, man? So for me, like, I'm grateful that I still have a job. You know, I'm mm. still working. Although it's different, sports are back. Because when they weren't here, I wasn't doing anything. I wasn't really making a lot of money because a lot mm. of that money is made going on the road and, and spending oh, a lot wow. of time out there. Yeah. So I'm grateful to be working. I'm grateful on my family. My family is still is still alive and well and healthy. I'm healthy. Mm. Um, and, and, you know, I'm grateful for those things. And I think you have to keep that perspective because if not, man, you, you can get really worn down. You know, I think mm. we, we, we spend so much time on, man, this is going wrong. And this is going wrong and that and that ain't working out but what is working out wow what's something that you get to do every day because guess what there's folks out here that have covid that can't smell right taste. they've lost their sense of taste yeah you know what i mean and they're and they're fighting they're fighting yeah the recovery rate is high but it sucks to go through it you know what i mean mm -hmm. so there's people out there who can't even do that right now including some of them are my co-workers Mm. And so my heart goes out to them because they, you know, their voices are, the voices are rough and, and they can't smell, they can't taste, they can barely move, you know what I mean? And it's, and, and even simple things like that, like you, you will be very grateful for the fact that you can breathe when wow. you go through a day or two struggling to breathe, you know what I mean? Wow. So um, that's, that, you, that, that's the best way I tell people to try to keep encouragement. What, figure out what you're grateful for, even if it's the smallest things, it ain't gotta be something big. Mm, I love that, bro. Sheely, man, you're somebody who's young, living life, have a job in your field, just graduated college. Yep. And you're somebody, which I love as well, who stays in the word, bro. How do you yeah. stay level-headed? Because I know sometimes as young men, we can get the big head. We can be like, oh, I'm doing this, I'm doing that. But how do you stay humble? And two, how do you stay in your word consistently? Because you already know as somebody who is an avid believer, sometimes when all the blessings start coming in, we stop mm -hmm. praying as much. We stop <laughs> meditating as much, and, yeah. and we can get super comfortable. But then when things ain't, you know, running so hot, we'll be the right. first ones praying and pleading. So yeah. how do we stay consistent in the Word? Man, um, I think it's just about a constant pursuit of uh, a constant pursuit to to be the way that, that God intended us to be, you know, mm. have our have our hearts pouring out what he wants it to. And so there was a book I got. I think it's, it's sitting over there on my on my um, on my table, um, and it's called the Cross Centered Life. I got it. I was visiting the church, and that you got a free book, and so that was, wow. that was a free book. Wow! And basically, man, it was talking about all right. You know what the gospel is like. You understand all that, but that should be at the very center of it. Because mm -hmm. here's here's the thing. Here's the thing about that. At the end of the day, right, we, we are basically called to do just a few things here. We're called to be, um, we're called to, ha of course, have faith, right? But in that, we're supposed to bear good fruit. So, that, you know, the fruits of the spirit, yeah. um, we're, we're supposed to, we're supposed to love on our neighbors as we love ourselves. Um, you know, we're supposed to, to love, love God with all our heart, mind, soul, right? Um, and then just be a good witness to people. Mm -hmm. And so that mission doesn't stop. So yeah, I could accomplish all kind of all kind of stuff. Like I could, you know, have awards and this and that, and the third. But I think for us, um, and it's also someone someone brought brought up a comparison. I was I, I listened to a um, a, a couple of um, church podcasts, um, and ba basically they're just they're just sermons that are on Spotify. <laughs> but um, 
it was like it's like a it's like a like a tree mm. you know like so okay a tree is planted right and starts growing the tree doesn't stop becoming a tree you know what i mean it continues to grow and mature as a tree mm. to where us we continue to to grow and mature as believers and that that process doesn't doesn't stop wow so well that's you should continue wanting to do that i don't think there's ever just like we're never done learning well you're never done witnessing to people you're never done just showing good fruit and sometimes you know witnessing doesn't mean you're going door to door knocking on doors talking about hey we're going to talk about jesus you know what i'm saying it mm -hmm. could just be in the way that you move people saying okay i don't understand how he keeps such a level head i don't understand how he can do that and it's because man the word tells us that you know that God's never going to forsake us. He's not hasn't mm. forgotten us. He's not going to forsake us. And nothing we do can separate us from him. And then, you you know, when you rely on those things, that's all good news. Like, that's, you know, why why be why be upset? Because that's, if, if, if I am super upset and I'm letting my circumstances determine how I move and how I feel, that means I don't really trust, I don't really trust what God, what God says in his, in his mm. word. That, that's really what it boils down to. And I'm not, now I'm not saying that to say I'm perfect. Cause yeah. I'm still working on that, you know, um, yeah. not working on being perfect, but just working on just, I'm, I'm continuing, to, continuing, uh, to mature in my faith. Like that, that maturation process or sanctification process. Um, it, you know, it doesn't really finish. Mm, I respect that, bro. And David, man, for all the young black men out there right now, who be tuning in or just out there struggling. And, and I've seen this where men, they'll say, yo, it's hard being somebody who's in the word or somebody who's focused and goal driven and i'm in this mm -hmm. society where women may want a man who's doing this or who's doing that but i'm right. focused on what i'm doing on this come up right now and i'm focused in the word which already makes me not in the mix when it comes to going to certain parties certain mm -hmm. events doing certain things and moving a certain type of way for guys who may feel not confident in being seen or or not fitting in what words of advice would you have for them well i mean i feel like why you know there, there's a lot of things that in in the word that talk about not being able to fit in or not mm. not really fitting in like mm. um it's almost as if we're called to be peculiar people as mm. as christians if, if i'm speaking from a christian perspective right christians christians are they were persecuted they're still mm. being persecuted around the world mm. um there was a time where you know they were they were beheading they were beheading christians and i remember oh, what book was that i think it was in the book of um i think it was in the book of romans um where they were like, hey, you need to, they were talking to the, they were talking to a group of people, they were about to get persecuted for, for following Jesus. And they were like, you know what? The fact that they saw you and they saw how you were moving and they saw your spirit and they was like, oh, nah, you see the way he moving, he a Christian, we got to kill him. Like, that's Dang. a good thing. You know what I mean? So they know whose side you're on. And they were like, and you know where you're going when you cross the other side. So, um, but for us, man, it's not, I never fit in. I never, I never fit in. Like, mm. like when, whatever trend you can bring up i probably didn't participate i was just thinking about it earlier today yeah. I, didn't, I when remember when skating was really cool man um er, everybody was skating because skating, skating. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Lupe fiasco was, was skateboarding i was i didn't skateboard yeah. you know I, I, mm. I, I didn't wear skinny jeans i didn't wear snapbacks i think i own one snapback yeah. but it i ain't even like the way it fit my head so i didn't wear snapbacks i didn't have like all those different trends man it was like i never really fit that i never had the high top fade either mm. like, everybody had that kentucky starting five high mm. top fade. <laughs> yeah. i did not do it like i i just i never fit in so i think we need to stop trying to figure out how we can fit in with the rest of the world and figure out how we can stand out you know what mm. i mean why 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 try to blend in with everybody else and I, I and that goes with anything that could be your career that can be your life I can be whatever. Like, why? Why are you trying to fit and just go with the flow? Because then you just, what? How are you any different than anybody else at that point? That's big facts, bro. David, speaking on standing out, you transfer into a school like Georgia State, downtown, mm -hmm. Atlanta. How did you leave your mark, or how did you even start networking, getting more involved on campus, uh, NABJ, primetime sports? what helped you to step out of that comfort zone? Because bro, think about it, man. Most people fold at state. Like most people get overwhelmed and they just stay <laughs> yeah. in a box. Cause it's like, yo, it's a lot yeah. going to class. It's a lot. Yeah. Just being in class, it's a lot of people. So how did you do it? Well, I think it's, I was just driven dude, because mm. when I, so when I left Hampton, it was because I didn't foresee at that point how I could 
use the tools that they were providing that would lead mm. me to a job when I graduated. Mm. I just didn't see it. And like, I was mm. like, I don't, I was like, I'm not seeing it, man. I didn't really see it. And then at Georgia state, I, you know, I was looking for it, man. In fact, my spring break of freshman year, I didn't go on, I didn't go to PCB or nothing like that. Mm -hmm. I toured Georgia state's campus. I wanted to see what was going on. And I went on to campus and I was like, I need to know what they got moving. I got to know what they're doing at Georgia state. Like, do they have a sports show? Do they have a news show? Do they have something? And um, I, I found out, obviously, they did at GSTV. And I was like, all right. And I bothered the heck out Jamal at the time, who was he was a team leader. And I was like, hey, this is what I want to do. Like, I'm for real. I had a reel coming out of Hampton, which I, wow. I, know, I have no clue where it is, which it didn't have a lot on it. It had, like, maybe two things on there. But <laughs> it wasn't a lot. But I was like, I have something. I had a reel coming out of high school just in case I needed to audition. I was like, man, I'll, I'll audition anything, man. Mm. And so when I came in, I was for real. Like, I was I was hungry. And I think that's that's the biggest thing. That's why when I, when we had every time I had some different kids come in, and they was like, "I want to do this," you know, I want to be a part of prime time. The ones that stuck were the hungriest ones, man. Like who was who was hungry to be great? Because you can have all kind of talent, natural raw talent, but if you aren't hungry for it, and if you don't strive for it, you know, mm -hmm. what I mean, it's not gonna work. Because you gonna you gonna make time for what you're passionate about. That's facts. You're gonna That's make facts. time for it. Um, I understand that we all have time commitments, and, and Georgia State's one of those schools where people got full time jobs. People got yeah, paid. bro. People, I don't Georgia know how State, people's doing it. <laughs> yeah, Georgia State is a completely different vibe than any other college I've ever even seen before. Because you could be you could be in your thirties, you could be in your twenties, and be a, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like people are forty years old and a sophomore. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. And they're like, oh, I'm just a sophomore, bro, <laughs> and you sit next to them in class. So yeah. Georgia State just built like that. So I understand people had obligations and whatnot. So I'm not going to shame somebody if they legitimately was like, I do not have time to put in to this like I thought I did. And you know mm. what? That's all right. But for the ones that only had to go to class and, and go home and maybe work a part-time job, I was like, you can make some time now. You could have made some time. So I, it, it was to me, it was like, who's hungry for it? And I, I was I was hungry. I was mm. really hungry. And, and I just kept going and going because – at the end of the day, I could say I was like, well, in college, I remember I covered a couple football games and I did this. But at the end, when I graduate, will I have a job? Mm, or will I have yeah. to start just doing other stuff so I can just, well, I remember I was a journalism major in college. You know what I mean? But it's like, but what did you do with it, though? Mm, yeah, I love that, bro. So, Sheely, speaking on that with jobs, how do you feel, and I know you probably heard this before plenty of times when you would probably tell people, hey, I'm a journalism major. Sometimes people, they'll say, oh, you'll never get a job in your field. There's no money in that industry. What are your thoughts on that for somebody who actually got a job in your field? <laughs> in well, yeah, I mean, I'm not, I'm not super rich. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. I'm, I'm not. I mean, like, Skip, Skip Bayless, right? There's only one Skip Bayless for a reason. There's only one Stephen A. Smith for a reason. They make millions mm -hmm. of dollars, but it took them a long time to get there, right. right? I think there is no, and I tell people this all the time, there is not a single cookie-cutter path to making it in this industry. There's not. Facts. There's no cookie cutter like, all right, you need to do A, B, and C, like there is to do mm -hmm. in other industries. There's mm -hmm. So like, if you want to be a lawyer, everybody knows there are certain things you need to do, a program you need to pass, and a test you need to pass if you want to be a lawyer. It's mm -hmm. very, it's set in stone. It's like, this is, it, this is how you do it. You got to go to law school. You got to do this. You got to do that. All kind of stuff. But in journalism, man, who knows? It's like, I don't, you know, they're like, all right, so how exactly do I make, I can tell you what tools you need to make it, but, you know, I can't tell you how to make it. But when, yeah, when you get there, no, it's not going to be a lot of money at first. Um, of course, you can get there. It can probably be at least be a comfortable amount. But, yeah, I mean, no, it, it's not going to be one of those things where you, you get a job coming out of college and you're making 90000 a year. Right. There, there are industries like that. Journalism is not one of those. But you know, that's, that's, you know, you got to be good at money and budgeting and figuring out how to live below your means and everything. Facts. I'm blessed enough to live in a very cheap place. Like Knoxville, man, gas here is like 160 right now. Chilling. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> gas here is like 160. My rent, I pay more rent at 112 than I'm paying here, bro. I believe that. 
I believe yeah. that. <laughs> I, paid, I was paying. I was paying nearly nine hundred dollars a month to live in one twelve. And you know, one twelve college apartments, I, bro. That's what in CC. That's what people got to understand. Yeah, bro. We were living in the heart of downtown, bro. We were living in the heart of downtown, paying for a bedroom. We didn't even get the whole space. It was the bed. Like I'm being charged for my bedroom, bro. Yeah. This is for, this is for the bed and the shower, bro. Yeah. <laughs> Nothing else. This is for the bed and the shower downtown. And yeah. here, of course, I got my own spot and everything. Like I got mm. my whole, I got my own spot, and I'm paying less than eight hundred dollars every month. That's with everything. It. That's with everything included, bro. I believe it. Yeah. I believe it. Sheely, bro, you talking about living below your means, man. Can you speak on the importance of that for young journalists or just, you know, kids who's graduating from college? Because I think sometimes that we get this grand idea about all this money. And even if you do obtain that, the importance of living below your means. Yeah, I think it all goes back to liquidity, bro. Like, everybody's got to have liquidity. And, and look, at 22, 23, 24, man, if you got liquidity, then, like, you are incredibly blessed. Mm -hmm. But in in the grand scheme of things, man, liquidity is something that's built up over time um, because if something happens, because you never know. So, like, back in, uh, I think it was June, like, I got a flat tire. Well, wow. I don't have a lot of, I don't have a lot of liquid liquidity mainly because I was furloughed during, um, during the summer. Wow. Um, and I wasn't getting as many hours as I was when sports was around. So, you go from making a lot of money to, dang, you just without any money for a little bit. Mm. So you get furloughed. And so I didn't have that liquidity, bro. So I got that flat tire. I had, now, my brother's in the Navy. My brother, you know, he, he ain't paying for nothing. He's getting paid because he's in the military, and they, he, he's not going to have to pay for anything anyway. So I mm. had to borrow some money and everything and went, went ahead and took care of that. But had I had liquidity, it would have been like, you know what? it's an emergency, this happened, and then you went ahead and just, you know, you took care of it because that's mm. that's just how it goes. So, it, yeah, bro, like, that's, it's important to build that up, and you gotta live below your means. Don't don't get you this nice little condo with a view if, <laughs> if you're gonna be left with, like, $100 in your account afterwards, you know what I'm saying? You gotta, mm. you gotta pile that up. You gotta keep, you gotta keep a whole bunch in the, in the, in the stash because if something goes away, all of a sudden, you don't wanna be like, wait a minute, what am I gonna do with my what am I gonna do with my uh about my rent? What am I gonna do about this? What am I gonna do about that? You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Cause then cause then then what you gonna do? Like I I think you you gotta have at least a couple months rent in your in your savings if you can. Like it takes That's time what they say. To get that. Yeah, you, you got it takes time to get mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. So be patient with yourself. But yeah, like it's you know, you gotta play when it comes to money, you definitely gotta play the long game. Like you gotta play the long game. Yeah. Um, she Lee out here giving free game, man. Shout out to our boy Dre. I see you, Dre. Yeah, what's up, man. Dre? She Lee, bro, you even talking about that. That's so important. And even talking about COVID again as well. Mm -hmm. You having to go through trials and tribulations, which we already know in the word. You already gonna see them, but it's about yeah. how you deal with it, bro. During right. that time, man, how did you tap in and stay focused? Because most people, they could have panicked, could have said, Maybe I'm going to have to quit or maybe I'm going to have to do this instead. But you stayed in there and you saw it through. So how did you do it? Well, COVID, like, that wasn't even the worst situation for me when it came to finances. Mm -hmm. If we go back to 2018, bro, I was incredibly, incredibly broke. I, was in, I wasn't working at GSTV anymore. And that was that's where a lot of that money was coming from. Um, and it was my last semester. Um, of co of college, of course. That's when we uh, that's when we had sports journalism. Mm -hmm. And man, I was just bro. Before I got that job at, at Joseph A. Bank, I was actually parking people's cars, and that was the most inconsistent. I was a valet. It was the most inconsistent job ever. All like, tip money too, right? Yeah, it was all tip money, but it was like, yeah. it was a pool, so it was like mm -hmm. there was a way to divvy it up. It was fair. It was fair, but it was very inconsistent, man. Because one night the tip out could be. I had a tip out of about a hundred dollars one time, mm -hmm. which was great. Felt great. Another time I had a tip out of sixteen. Mm. Mind you, mind you, it cost me eighteen to get there because I didn't have a car at the time. I had to Uber. Wow. Right. So the Uber was nine there, nine back. Tip out was sixteen. So basically I worked for a net of minus three. <laughs> yeah. So all that sweat, wow. all that running around for minus three. That's, you know what I'm saying? That's, I said, that's not going to work. I said, I need something better. And um, I had, bro, I'm telling you, I had no money. 
and I, I made it through that situation. So I knew I was still going to, I was still making something. Mm -hmm. And I knew, you know, I just kind of went back to that plan in 2018. I said, all right, what did I do to survive when it came to eating? I've never had so much pasta in my life, bro. Because <laughs> pasta, you know what I'm saying? Pasta ain't nothing but a, a few ingredients, bro. Get your That's sauce. That's it. Hey, just stir it up. And you stir it up. <laughs> and, it, and you make a good load of it, man, it'll feed you for days, bro. Yeah. And then at the next time, just make just make another pasta, bro. Mm. Like, So we just kept it like that and, and um, just kept striving through. And like I said, I was still making some money. It wasn't like I was – because I had $5 to my name. Wow. You know what I mean? When in 2018, I had nothing until I started working at Joseph A. Bank, and then it was like a, a few hundred every couple of weeks, which was which was good. It helped, especially in college. Yeah, yeah, especially in college, man. But I knew once I made it through that, which was so 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 tough, man. Once I made it through that, I just saw things different. I saw like hustling a little bit different. Like, all right, there's got to be ways to you know have a hustle, and I can't let something like this happen to me again. Even though I was in college, and people were like, well, it's okay to be broke in college. It didn't feel right to be broke in college because I nah, was hungry. not at all. Yeah, I was still hungry. <laughs> yep. So I, you know, I figured that out, and then um, you know, going through COVID, man, it was just about you know, all right, how do I make sure I preserve my money and don't go crazy at the grocery store? I can't get all the stuff I used to get all the time. Mm. You know, I can't be like, you know what? I'm gonna make this like I got. I bought like a, a cookbook for men. It was like a men's cookbook, had oh. all these cool meals in it, and I was like, well, I can't go out and buy all these ingredients. You know what I mean? Mm. I just got to stick with the pasta right now. Mm. Man, my boy, I respect it, man. I can't tell you that enough. David, you've you've dealt with that. And I know during this time, people are also dealing with the same thing. And young black journalists in college or even freshly out of school, for people right now who's working those jobs and mm -hmm. in those transitionary periods, what words of advice and inspiration do you have for them to just continue to stay focused on their dreams? Well, I think it's just about knowing what your purpose is, bro. Like, mm. at the end of the day, I knew I, I knew my purpose was in sports journalism. I knew my my identity is in sports journalism, but I knew my purpose was in this because mm. ultimately this is like a form of, you know, me doing what I need to do is like a form of like a form of worship is a form of witness. It, it puts me on a platform to be able to spread that good word. And if you know what your purpose is, then you got to know the there are some stepping you know, there's some stones and there's, there's probably a purpose for why you are in that, in that previous stage. Hmm. My purpose, my purpose for, for parking cars was because I need to learn how to drive stick. I didn't know that, but I need to you learn got how to something out of it. And I made some, right. Mm -hmm. And now the, the only car I could afford when I graduated was a stick shift. Wow. <laughs> yeah. The only, the wow. only car I could afford when I graduated from state was a stick shift. So now here I am using the stuff I learned when I was valeting cars, hated the job, bro. Hey, I just talked about how, how inconsistent that pay was. But now, because of I had to learn that skill, mm. I drive a stick shift now. And I'm like, mm. of course, it was the only car I could afford. And then when it came to working at Joseph A. Bank, I actually really enjoyed that job. You know, I knew my purpose wasn't in retail, but I enjoyed that job. Well, you just never know what that purpose could be. I found out what my true suit size was. I was wearing, I was, a, at the time, I was a size 38. I was a size 38, maybe fringe 39. Now I'm a size 40 because I've been eating and working out. But um, I was wearing 40. Either way, I was wearing 42s, bro. I was wearing wow. 42s when I was a size 38. Yeah, Steve Harvey's, baby. Man, I was, I was wearing them big old suits, bro. I was like, why well, I got these big old suits on, man? I was wearing these big suits for no reason. Um, yeah. And I, I knew my – I was like, the suit does seem kind of big, but I couldn't really tell for sure. But the first time I put on a 38, 39, I was like, bro, like, this suit fitted, man. Like, it. <laughs> yeah, you know what I'm like, bro, I look yeah. good, bro. So now yeah. I'm wearing suits that actually fit me on air. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, man, it's you know, I, I really can't complain, bro, because that that purpose is what, what drove me. And then, of course, God was able to use that. That's the thing. People – People got to understand, man, God can take the good and the bad and make a beautiful mosaic out of that. I'm telling you. So that, that purpose, man, yeah, you got to stay on You got to stay on your purpose, know what that is, and make sure you're working towards that. Because mm -hmm. guess what? Just because I was working at Joseph A. Bank parking cars didn't mean I wasn't in sports journalism going as hard as I could in that class, mm -hmm. trying, to, trying to leave my mark, you know, because I had, I had to. Yeah. I was still I was still working on my reel in the back end. I was still hosting Georgia State games for uh, ESPN Plus on the back end. Killing it. 
Yeah, like I had to because that was that was that was my purpose. Ultimately, I was just working towards that. So mm. people got to keep their eye on the ultimate purpose and stay and stay on that and stay on that. Preaching, preaching, bro. I love it, man. I see you, Dre, in the comments. And speaking on Dre, bro, I remember one of our proudest moments of you, man. I think it was um, it might have been opening night, I think, bro, for that uh, football State season. Game. That's when it yeah. was. Mm -hmm. And, you know, with uh, Professor Galvin, yep. whole crew, all of us chilling. And yep. I was more excited about seeing you on the big screen and commentating yeah. and talking and seeing our boy on the big screen representing us and us being able to see somebody who looks like us, talks like yep. us, walks like us, has conversations with us, be mm -hmm. on the big screen, commentating sports. And you already know, man, as guys, black men, we love sports. So seeing somebody oh, yeah. we know yeah, yeah, yeah. who we can connect with, on yep. TV at the same time, man, you can't beat it. It was more entertaining than even watching the game. Sheely, bro, how did you even get a foot in the door with ESPN Plus? And two, which another element that people sleep on all the time is when you get that foot in the door, then you got to execute. How did you do all yeah. of those things? Well, man, I was I was really trying to um, and this is a shout out to my to my girl Jael because she she had been the the sideline reporter for Georgia State, which I didn't know, man. She was at Georgia State games so much, I thought she was a student online. Wow. She never even went to Georgia State. Wow. <laughs> she told us. Are you serious? In, um, I'm so, bro, we were in Miami for the NABJ conference in 2018. And we were like, hey, when did you ever graduate from state? Because I said, you went to online school, didn't you? She was like, no, nah, I never even went to state. But she, wow. but she was at every football game, every basketball game, doing the um, <laughs> sideline reporting. So wow. I was trying to do sideline reporting because I thought, I thought she graduated and was about to like move on. Mm. No, <laughs> she, she said that's about mine. <laughs> yeah, she she was like, nah. She was like, I ain't going nowhere. And I was like, dang, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, so um, I knew um through her, I knew the people who were like in charge of broadcasting the game because when it comes to ESPN three and ESPN plus, that's an institutional thing. Mm -hmm. That's not that's not an ESPN thing. It's just an institutional thing that just so happens to use ESPN as the medium to broadcast their stuff. Wow. So I went over and I was like, hey, this is what I'm trying to do. I, I Obviously, at that point, I had a, a full reel from, from GSTV, like primetime stuff. I was mm. like, all the, I said, you know how much Georgia State football I didn't cover <laughs> at this point? So I had all of that. I had all kind of stuff. And it was all good and ready for me. And um I sent that over, I think. I think that's how it happened. Um, I think they wanted to – I think there was a day where um, they wanted to meet up. So they wanted the sideline reporter there. They wanted the um, in-game host, like the dudes who would be in the crowd. They wanted them there. And then they wanted um, me because they were like, we have a – like, we think we, we have something for you that would be completely new. So I'm like, they're going to make a, com a completely new position just for me. And I was like, okay. So I got there, and they were talking to the in-game host. Jael already knew what she was going to do. She's a sideline reporter. You know what a sideline reporter does? Like, all right, does. That was just a formality. And they were like, all right, so this is what you're going to do. You're going to be like our in-game, in-game, like, anchor or something. Mm. And I was like, okay. And they were like, you'll do the – you'll do, like, a pregame show. And you'll do, like, the highlights after every touchdown drive. And then you'll do the – um. Then you'll like then then they said something about a post game show that we never got to do, but they they wanted to do like a post game show on social media, but we never got around to doing that. But mainly it was gonna be in game, pre game, and in game anchoring, where I'm just going over the highlights and whatnot. So um, yeah, that first game was like the biggest opportunity right there because it was it was GSU KSU and it was like bro mm -hmm. this is this, this everybody gonna be here man half the yeah. stadium was blue and the other half was yellow. Yep. I remember that and it was crazy. So I'm sitting up in there and I'm, and I was, uh, I don't even know if I have it on my desk. I'm looking for it. I don't think it's here, but I had this notebook. Oh, you know what it was? It was a notebook that we were required to buy. For I know what you're journey. talking about. Yeah, yeah. It, was that, it was that notebook. <laughs> and so, in fact, if I look through that notebook, man, there are so many game notes from Georgia. I was covering the Falcons at the same time. So there's Georgia mm. state, there's Georgia state notes and Falcons notes in that exact notebook. Um, that I took notes from. So during that game, I was taking notes because after Georgia State would score a touchdown, I had to run into the other room, grab the mic, and then do the highlights on the big board. So yeah, there was there was a whole bunch of stuff. So I mean, it was it was just about all right. Now that they've given me this position, you know, what am I going to do to maximize it? 
Because mm. you don't want to get there and just be some dude that's like, I don't know who that is. He's just, <laughs> he's just talking. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, you're doing, like, the pregame, the pregame show. So I had keys to the game. And so I was out, and, and that's stuff I did at Georgia State or at um, with prime time where, you know, I'm looking up, okay, who's the best player on the other team? What do they do? What what are they, you know, what was their skill set? And, you know, KSU was running that, like, the triple option. They had this, yeah. this real fast kid at quarterback. And I was like, you got to slow that brother down. Like, if you don't do it, it's going to be a problem. He was nice. <laughs> yeah, he was real nice. And I was yeah. like, yeah, you got to slow him down. You got to do this. You got to do that. And once we had that recorded, man, it was like, all right, this is great. You know, and it was just, it was just more reps. Mm, that's good, man. More reps. I like that because what you said was so pivotal, man, when you were talking about for this opportunity, you already had your reels from doing all the other opportunities. So what's the importance of young journalists staying consistent and realizing, yo, you're building a library. So when that when that big shot does come by you being right. consistent, now you right. can present them and say, yo, I've been doing this for a minute. Yeah. So it's like I said, it's it's all about reps. And I tell people. I tell people that, like, you got to start, like, as soon as you find out, is this what you want to do? Just start doing it. Mm -hmm. Just start doing it. Because this is one of those industries where you got to have experience to get the job to get the experience. And it's yeah. not really, and it's not really fair, like, yep. at all. But it is what it is. So if I'm, if I'm talking about, I, I want to be a journalist, I want to be a journalist. And you discovered that senior year, my brother, it is really late to figure out that you want to be a journalist, man. Whew. Senior year, you know, <laughs> give yourself a semester. You're like the first, it takes, it takes three semesters. I tell the, I tell, I tell people this, it takes at least, at least three semesters of active student journalism work to really feel like you got something. Mm, yeah, yeah, semester, yeah, yeah. You just, you just learning the game. You learning the real basics. Then you get some critiques on that. In your second semester, you start figuring out like, okay, now I know the basics. Let me, let me start doing that efficiently and 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 much better instead of just trying to learn. And then that third semester, you're like, I right, I know the basics, I know what I'm supposed to do, I know how to do it quickly. How can I get creative with it? And that third semester is the one where you get some stuff together where you're like, you know what, man, this is actually pretty good stuff. And now you have a little bit of a reel, like you have a little bit of a reel. And that can help you get help you get an opportunity for whatever that is. Um, mm. And then some people figure out, you know, I don't want to go the local news route. And that's OK, too. But if you do understand, it takes like to me, it takes a solid three semesters to really get something that's like, OK, I got something like mm. I got something here because I'll tell you what. A lot of people have those reels from like two semesters. They get a job, but it's not on camera. They're a producer. It's fast. They're behind the scenes. They're. They're um, what's it called? Uh, uh, like a, like a not not a manager, but like you're you're a producer or you're an associate producer. I was, yeah, I was yeah. just gonna say that. Yeah, yeah, an associate producer. Yeah. Like you're doing something else when mm -hmm. you're like, man, but I was on camera, man. But like I said, it takes three solid semesters. So it was, mm -hmm. you know, it wasn't something that after after um, like some management didn't really fit full with it. But I I mean, when I was in charge of prime time, I would turn you away if you were a senior. Like I would just, I'd be like, nah. You Are can't you do serious? Oh yeah, I would turn, I would turn, bro. I turn people away respectfully. I wasn't disrespectful about it. It was just like, yeah. I just knew. I'm like, I'm not, I'm not going to waste my time trying to train this person, get this person ready, when they're gonna leave the show mm. immediately. Yeah. Like you had to be, you had to be a journalism major. I didn't need somebody who was a math major. Like, oh, I just think it's kind of fun. I just want to try it out. You wait, you're taking the spot away from another kid. Mm. So I'm not going to let you take a spot and I'm not going to put all this effort into training you because I'm not going to let my show look bad. My show not going to look bad because you don't know what you're doing. So I'm not going to let nobody just come in here like, oh, uh, you know, you got stuff missing and equipment missing. So there's all these different rookie mistakes and a learning curve that you have to go through. So once you get through that learning curve and you graduate, what I just do all that training for? Mm. You know what I'm saying? I just did all this training to, to help you out and, and try to make you the best reporter I could just for you to graduate. And you're probably not going to get a job off of this first semester stuff. So I would turn I would turn seniors away. I tell people if you can if you come to me as a freshman sophomore, man, I can I was like I got you. I can get you. I can get you somewhere now. Mm. You can get some stuff together. And and 
I'm not going to sit here and say I was the best recruiter. A lot of the guys and people that we recruited together wasn't – like, they're not really on TV right now, some of them, but they are in journalism. Um, and, not, and that's okay. They made it. They're not They're not a carpenter. You know what I'm saying? They're not working at Ruby Tuesdays. Yeah. They're not – you know what I'm saying? They, they could be doing all kind of other stuff. So um, I think it's, it's – I'm, I'm grateful that they're at least in journalism. But, yeah, bro, you got to get them reps quick. Mm. You gotta like you gotta get them reps. If you figure out you want to do this freshman year, all right, go for it. If you figure out that's not what you want to do, okay, find something. You know, find find whatever it is that you want to do. But if this is really what you feel called to, get them reps now. Don't don't wait till your junior senior year. That's facts. I love that. And Sheely, man, you out here arising questions right here. Let's see, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Elijah Collins, 06. How long have you been reporting? I'm coming up on my first year. For sure. So, um. I've been reporting professionally since January 2019. So that's when I got my first job here in, in Knoxville, Tennessee. Um, and so I've been, it'll be two years. I'll be celebrating two years on January 28th. Of already. January that's crazy. Yeah. Already, already. <laughs> it'll be, it'll be, I completed two years of this. Um, and before that, uh, obviously I was in college doing, doing reporting. So I was in high school doing it. So I've been, I've been reporting since like, the ninth grade, bro. Mm. I was like 13, 14 years old. Been been doing sports either on the radio, on the announcements in high yep. school or some, something since since then. So, because um, when I got to college, I mean, or when I got to Georgia State, rather, I got to Georgia State, I was 19 when I got to Georgia State. I already had like five years of journalism <laughs> teaching under my belt. Wow. <laughs> Like I had been in classes and camps and all kind of stuff, just like just like a player would be, you know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. like a player, he was going to camps and 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 um, sessions and all this since he was, you know, twelve years old, trying to be the best player he could. Because he's like, I gotta go D one and I gotta, you know, what I'm saying I gotta make it to the league. It was the same mm -hmm. thing, just in the journalism route. I like that because I I always think about that, Sealy. Like I feel like with us, it's just like playing sports, like. You still got to sharpen your craft. If, yep. if you do a podcast, like you need to be interviewing people at least once every two weeks, minimum, because you have to sharpen those skills. Because, I mean, if you stop using it, you'll get rusty just like shooting a basketball, playing oh, yeah. football, man. Yep. So hearing you say that is really, really dope. And, bro, as well, with seeing you, and I remember I seen a year covering the Falcons. What was that experience like as well? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, real quick, Eliza. Yeah, I went to GSU, graduated in uh, 2018. But yeah, so man, covering the Falcons. So, man, the, the signal, this is really a lot of this stuff is really going back to Rashad, bro. Like Rashad, Rashad was like the best assist wingman. All that was that cool. Yeah, like dude, dude leads my life in assists, bro. Like mm. he sent a lot. Of, it was a lot of assists. And um, he got this opportunity through the signal to cover the college um, football awards. So, cause you know, the, you know, the, um, college football hall of fame right there down the street. And shoot, when you go to Georgia yep. state and you live in downtown Atlanta, this stuff is a walk away. You can yes, walk. bro. Everything. We were, we were walking. So he was like, bro, <laughs> he said, we got, we got, um, he said, I got, I got credentials for the, uh, college football awards, bro. Come, come with me, be my cameraman. It's like, say less. Mm. You know, we interviewed, we interviewed Lamar Jackson. We interviewed Deshaun Watson. We interviewed, wow. um, Young Way Koo. We interviewed uh um what's old dude name, bro? He um uh, oh Jabril Peppers. Yeah, we was talking. We was talking. To all he was the man guys. at Michigan too at the he time. He was the man. Oh, and, we, and bro, we we sat down and had like a ten minute conversation with Dalvin Cook, just a regular wow. old conversation, bro. Like we, cause at the time, you know, we're all in college, so we were just talking to him like like kids, like we had class with him, like. Hey, man, <laughs> you ever just, like I remember we asked Dalvin. We was like, bro, do you ever just be in class and be like? Man, I just can't wait to make it to the league, man. I ain't doing the homework. I ain't doing that. You know what I'm saying? So now nah, it was it was really cool. And so we met this we met this guy. His name is Greg, and he had a website. And Greg was like, "Well, I got a website. I'm looking for writers." And at the time, I had done I was a, I had a Falcons blog when I was a uh, senior in high school. Wow. And so then I got picked up by a blogging site called uh, ProFootballSpot.com. And so I was like, and then they promoted me to the Falcons editor because I was the most read Falcons writer when I was there. I was there from 20, uh, 2014, the end of 2014 through, I think it was the 20, 
15 season, and then oh, I left. That's hard, David. That's yeah, crazy, yeah, yeah. man. I never so I was, knew that. I was, I was the most read Falcons writer on that site. And, but, I, but, man, you know how much I got paid for doing all of that? What? $25. Wow. Talk about a 360 deal for real. That was, that was it. <laughs> I got paid 25 because because they were like, at first when I got recruited, I was I was a freshman in college. And they were like, we're not, we're not paying nobody right now. And I was like, man, I don't care. I'm going to do it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And then after that, they were like, we're going to start paying y'all. And I'm like, man, I'm like, I wasn't the most read guy on the site, but I was the most read Falcons writer. And then they changed the whole format. And they were like, nobody's a Falcons writer or something, whatever, whatever. Now you're just division writers. So I went from writing for the Falcons to writing about the Saints, the Bucks, and the Panthers. Mm. But I'm like, I'm in Atlanta, though. Yeah, you don't so, care about no – <laughs> no Panthers yeah. game. Yeah, so I was yeah. like, man, they changed everything up, and I was like, ah, uh, I ain't really like that. And um, but they had, they were like, all right, well, they were like, hey, we do owe you some money, man. You've been, you've been doing a lot of good writing, whatnot. And they were like, let me know when you get the money. And I was like, all right, bet. I got a, I got a, a, a PayPal notification of twenty five dollars, bro. Yo, they ain't cool for that. Talk <laughs> about, 20, hey, we gonna see you some money. <laughs> and then, and then he gonna hit me up. He's like, hey, man, did you receive your check? And I was like. Well, I'm gonna do with this, man. So, yeah, bro. So I got twenty. I got twenty five dollars for that whole thing. And um, wow. But anyway, that that experience told Greg. He was like, okay, bet. So he had us. He had me and Rashad do something. He had us go cover a uh, Georgia Tech basketball game. They're playing North Carolina. Mm. And I was um I was on the floor, and Rashad was in the little press press box at the top, and he wrote the article. I took the pictures. And I took this one picture of of um of Coach, and Coach, bro, Coach was mad. Coach, uh, Coach Williams, and bro, Coach was mad about some call. Dude was red. He was yelling. He was yelling at this referee, and I, I just so happened to cap capture the, the picture of it, and it became the the um the front photo on wow. his website because UNC was ranked in the top ten, and they lost to Georgia Tech, who at the time was unranked. I think I remember that. Yeah. Yeah. So it was crazy. So that ended up being a big game. So Greg remembered that. And when it came time where he, he actually got credentials to the Falcons, he was like, yo, I got, he was like, I need a writer. He hit me up. He said, I need a Falcons writer. And I was like, he was like, what you mean? He was like, I, he said, I got passes for the season. And I was like, say less, bro. Like, I'm, <laughs> I'm down. Like, man, you got to say nothing else because. It was my dream, bro. It was like, man, I really want to one day. I want to. I want to step foot in the Georgia Dome. I want to cover the Falcons. I want to be in the locker room. I want all of this, right? And so the they weren't playing in the Georgia Dome anymore, but Georgia State used to play in the Georgia Dome. So I conquered the Georgia Dome mm -hmm. part. So the Georgia Dome part, I was good. And then after that, the new stadium gets built. So once the new stadium got built, I was like, bro, I'm going to be in the new stadium the moment they open it up. So I was Crazy. at the very, I was at the very first game, and I got the hat to prove it because you could History. only get the hat, and you had to be, you had to be there that night to get the hat. So I got the hat for the inaugural game. I got like, I mean, everything, man. So that was a huge, huge blessing, bro. I met all these people I used to look up to growing up, man. I met Peter King. I met, I met. Oh, you met people. Peter King, bro. I met. Bro, I got a picture with Peter King, man. I met Tony. That's Dungy. the guy. I met Tony Dungy that year. Mm. Um, man, I met, bro, I was talking to everybody. And so then after I went viral in 2018, cause I wrote for them for two seasons. Um, then it was them talking to me. Not this, that's when it got weird. Cause that, cause I was going up I'm like, Hey man, how you doing, man? I look up to you. This, that third. They're like, Hey, should you do it from Twitter? And I was like, Oh snap. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, no, that, that opportunity, man, was bro. It, it changed everything because if I'm not scared to talk to Julio Jones, then I ain't scared to talk to anybody. I love that. I love that. Sheely, you saying that, that's a really good point because I know sometimes that as journalists, when you see somebody growing up, you can get starstruck and be like, yo, like that's that's really Matt Ryan or that's, you know, really yeah. Julio. Yeah. But how do you seize the moment, stay professional, and kill the interview? Well, they're just a person at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. And, heck, to them, they're just another part of the media. So. Yeah. <laughs> You know yeah. what I mean? Like, yeah, okay, I look at the time, I, I didn't even have this hair on my chin. I had wow. nothing. So I look like a kid. Like, I stuck yeah. in there like, well, who let this kid in here? <laughs> but, um, yeah, like, it was just like, I'm going to just talk to these cats, man. I'm going to just, they're, they're people. So I'm going mm. to just talk to them, even though they don't know me. Um, I'm going I'm to just talk to them. So um, I remember it was, a, I think it was a preseason, and, and um, Julio – Julio did something or whatever it was. I have no idea. 
Um, but I asked Julio something, and we were just talking and everything. And yeah, it was it was it was bro, it was weird, man. Cause I was like, y'all, I'm sitting here talking to Julio, bro. <laughs> Crazy. I got the man jersey on my wall, man. He autographed. I was just when I was just a fan. I went to training camp and he signed my jersey. Mm. And now I'm sitting up in here interviewing the dude. It was, bro, it was something else. It's full circle. Yeah. Earlier you said something, David, and I know people bring this up all the time, but we got to talk about it. The guy from yeah. Twitter, bro. Yeah. What inspired <laughs> the real being posted on Twitter? Yeah. And two. I mean, I can't even ask, how did you feel? Because it's crazy because myself, Dre, we were around while it was happening. But yeah, yeah. just so everybody else, you know, they'll be able to know. How did you feel when you're posting your reel on Twitter and you mm -hmm. see millions of views, which yeah. I know you probably thought was fake, like refreshing the page. How did that <laughs> feel, man? <laughs> Bro, so first of all, what inspired me to post it was the fact that I was broke. <laughs> and mm. I was putting a job in journalism, <laughs> man, like... That was the thing. And so, but people do this all the time. Like, you get on mm. Twitter, people always like, hey, like, man, I just quit my job to pursue my dream as a chef. Look at the stuff I've cooked. Retweet, and my future clients could be on your page. And people like, hey, I just quit my job. I'm a painter. And these are some of my artworks right here. If you retweet it, maybe my future customers are on your page or something like that. So I was like, hey, in journalism, I don't see why not. Like, mm -hmm. I'm a journalist. Like, hey, I'm, I want to be a sports anchor. Yep. Here's my reel. Maybe this will give me a job. I was like, you know what I mean? Like, maybe, maybe one of y'all can give me a chance, man. Like, that's all I need, bro. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I put it out there. And I'm, I want to say, man, I'm not, I'm not the first person to do that. I was not the first person to tweet my reel out. Like, I, I wasn't, I didn't come up with some innovative idea. I gave the idea to one of my homegirls, and she posted her reel, and it did numbers too. It really did. And I was like, I'm not gonna get numbers like her. I was like, I'm already. I was like, I'm already knowing I'm not gonna get numbers like her. But I was expecting a hundred retweets max. I was like, I'm gonna probably get about a hundred, and I'm gonna pin the tweet to my profile, and I'm gonna keep it like that, and I'm gonna just go from there. Man, <laughs> I went to bed that the night I tweeted it. I went to bed with seven hundred retweets, and I was wow. like, Wow. Yeah, I went to bed with 700 wow. tweets. And so the next morning, I remember the Lord told me as I was going to sleep, he said, you're going to wake up with 1,000 retweets. Like, All right, whatever. So I went to sleep. I woke up the next morning. I had over 1,000 retweets. And then what's mm. so crazy was, so I had to get ready to go to, to go to work. At the time, of course, I was selling suits. And um, I got ready for work. I had work at 10. So I woke up at 8 with 1,000 retweets. By the time I clocked in for work at 10, I had 3,000. I was only working, I was working a four-hour shift that day because I was just part-time. When I clocked out at 2.30, I had 13,000. Like, I had 10K retweets in the span of Yo. four hours. <laughs> and, and the thing was, I couldn't have my phone out, bro, so I couldn't even see what's hitting. So I'm looking at my yeah. phone, bro. So I, <laughs> I snuck, I tried to sneak and look at my phone, bro. Marcellus Wiley had hit me up. Crazy. Nick Wright had hit me up. Uh, Maria um, Taylor too, right? My Robin bro, Roberts. Bro, bro, Maria Taylor. Robin Roberts didn't hit me up till a little bit later that day. Okay. Maria Taylor hit me up. Taylor Rooks, like all these people from ESPN. I'm like, hold on, bro, hold on. Like, I can't even look at my <laughs> phone, bro. How many people have I missed, bro? I didn't even discover until the other day, bro. Kurt Menefee hit me up, and I had no clue until the until like a few days ago, bro. Like maybe a couple weeks ago. I had no. I was looking through the retweets again, and Kurt Menefee was in there, and I was like, "Bro, I didn't even see it." That's how many I was getting, bro. So I didn't want to make it look like I had ghosted Kurt Menefee or something like that. And I was like, "I literally just didn't see it, man." Like I, I felt bad, but man, it was going crazy. It, it and mm -hmm. and so when I got off, every class at that point, sports, sports uh, journalism was over. Yeah, so I didn't have to worry about sports journalism no more. Practical then, was the only one. <laughs> yeah, that was that was the only. Yeah, that was like that was like uh, you know August through October. Mm -hmm. And then once we got done with that, I don't think I had any classes that day. I don't think I had any classes after that. So I just went home. Mm. So my phone, so I tried to check my phone. I was like, let me get on Twitter on my phone, bro. Twitter would not open on my phone. That's how overloaded it was. It was like, yo, Twitter yes. is not working. Twitter was not working for me. So I got on my computer and I turned on, um, I turned on the Twitter on the web, on like Google Chrome. Mm-hmm. So I'm sitting on my laptop, literally, for 10 hours. I was on my laptop from like 3, from like 2.30 to, to 12, 12.30 in the morning. 
just sitting there on my laptop, just scrolling on Twitter. I didn't watch TV that day. I didn't do nothing. And my phone was going crazy. My phone was, I mean, my phone was going nuts, man. It was like, bro, this is something, this is something else. And you know, man, I wasn't, I wasn't the type of dude to get into the spotlight. That wasn't me. Mm -hmm. I wasn't like, I don't, I don't really, I don't crave attention. I don't ask for attention. Yeah. I don't, I don't beg for none of that stuff. I just wanted some retweets, man, because I just wanted a job. And that was for me the best way to go get that, you know, probably get noticed. Mm. And it did. I was and about so, to say. <laughs> yeah, I was, it was because I felt like I was a talented dude. I was like, I'm yeah. talented. I, I know what I'm doing. So I feel like it could work. I didn't expect that, though. And so it went crazy. So, of course, my DMs went crazy, too, because it was like different people like, I got a job. I know about a job. I know. Mm. You know what I'm saying? So now I'm having to sift through, okay, who's hitting me up? Because I want to I want to thank everybody. I do. I want to thank everybody. But at the same time, I need to – this is all about getting a job. So mm -hmm. I need to make sure I looked at, all right, who is in my DMs offering me a job? Because I need mm. – that, that's, that's why we're here. I don't want to go viral just to be like, all right, appreciate it, y'all. didn't get a job, though. You know, I didn't I – yeah. didn't, so – yeah, man, it was that. I'm telling you, it was so overwhelming in the best way possible. It was crazy. Man, it I love that. Crazy. I love that. And David, you executed. You got the job. So yep. what was that experience of being in Atlanta? And yep. just say, of course, it's fun, having a great time. Got your friends there, boys there, play Madden yep. and chilling. But yep. then it's time to grow up and you go to Tennessee. And you already know we don't rock with Tennessee, but you go to Tennessee, <laughs> you go yeah. over there. Bro, what was that whole experience like of being in Ball's Land, where it's, it's orange instead of red and black, or you yeah. don't see blue anymore, and everything is orange, you're in a yeah. more quiet town? Because, yeah. bro, like, we were in the heart of Atlanta, like, Cortland Street, like, it was popping. Super Bowl yeah. was there, yeah. parties, Auburn Avenue, Edge. bro, you had the whole world at your fingertips. So, going yeah. from that to quiet Tennessee, what was that adjustment like for you? I moved to Tennessee the week of the Super Bowl, bro. I was wow. I went from living downtown wow in the most popping place like remember we had the MLS Cup you know what I'm saying the United won yeah. the MLS Cup right That was a fun street. year bro Exactly right down the yeah. street we had the national championship right yep. down the street Yeah uh, Georgia was in the SEC championship right down the street everything yeah. was right there and like right in front of us and it was like man that ain't far at all ain't nothing but walking mm -hmm. And so um going from that over here to Knoxville you know, Atlanta never goes to sleep. Knoxville, mm. Knoxville might be getting ready to go to bed right now. <laughs> like it's six o'clock. Yeah. It's dark outside. There's people probably getting ready for bed right now in Knoxville, man. So it was it was a different vibe. And I knew this was ball country. I knew that. Like, of course. I got up here, man. Everything got go balls on it, man. The donut shop, the barber shop, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? The 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 tire shop, everything <laughs> got got go balls on it, bro. This is a this is a 100% football town. They love football here. It's the lifeblood. They really, you know, they really want to enforce the fact that they love their orange and white. And if you don't love them, you can get out. Well, of course, you know, fate have it. Georgia State was scheduled to play Tennessee. Yes, my sir. First game here. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And I don't know, man. After, so after spending four years covering Georgia State, I was like, I, I've just covered. I just covered Georgia State for four football seasons. I know them boys can play. You I called said, it too, bro. You I, called, bro, I called it. it. I you said, called I know it. you boys can play. Yeah. And of course, me being on the Tennessee side, mm -hmm. I was I was listening to the press conferences and everything. And I was like, yo, these cats not ready, man. These cats are not ready. And I could just tell. I knew, I, and I was the new guy. So I had to kind of keep it on the low. And I was like, I'm, I know I'm the new guy and everything, but like, Tennessee ain't going to win this football game, bro. So I remember I told y'all, and I was like, yeah, Tennessee finna lose this game on Saturday. And y'all were like, "You are you sure?" And I was like, "Yeah, like." Hey, we still got a text message too. And I still and I still got the <laughs> screenshot just to prove yep. it. Man. I was like, "Nah, Tennessee is not ready, bro. Like Tennessee is going to get clapped on Saturday, and it's not going to be pretty." Like I'm trying to tell y'all now, mm. like it's something is like something's in the air, bro. Tennessee yep. is not ready. Show sure enough, bro. <laughs> like, <laughs> we get to Saturday, man. People people still remember that because of course I still got Georgia State gear. And I'm like, you know, if it's cold, I got a Georgia State, I got a Georgia State hoodie. So I walk around with it, and they're like, Georgia State, man, that's who beat Tennessee. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. You know what I'm saying? It had nothing to do. It's not like I'm not Dan Ellington, bro. I didn't play quarterback that day. Don't <laughs> do not get mad at me. I didn't do yeah. it. I didn't do it. So yeah, man, it was it was really a um, 
it was really a it was really a, a, a thing where I know this is all country, but I think immediately that like went out the window because everybody now associates me with be like being the Georgia State guy. So mm. I think I think there's like this healthy some odd healthy respect for the fact that all right. He may not be a Tennessee volunteer. He the Georgia State guy, but you know what? He covered us fairly that day. And I did. I didn't I didn't brag in nobody's face on camera. I did not get on TV acting the fool, man. I kept I kept a straight face the whole time. But as soon as that camera turned off, time to I, turn up. Man, I was acting <laughs> a fool when that camera turned off. But when it was on, yeah, I was a professional because that's my job. That's what mm. I do. So I think they respect the fact that I covered them fairly. I didn't rub it in their face. I didn't, you know, I didn't do anything like that. And um, not, and I still do to this day. And so mm. I just, co I covered the team fairly and, but yeah, I mean, I'm not going to sit here and act like I've been a Tennessee fan my whole life because I haven't, I'm not from here. Mm -hmm. That'd be fake. If I'm sitting there like, yeah, man, I've been a ball fan my whole life. No, bro. I'm, there are people that played for Tennessee. I didn't even know played for Tennessee. I didn't know Arian Foster went to Tennessee when I, before I got here. Yeah. I didn't know, you know what I'm saying? I didn't know. I thought Peyton Manning was the dude who won the national championship. He wasn't. It was the uh, year T. after Martin. that. Yeah, with T. Martin. And then I found out T. Martin was was part of the Brady Six. I didn't know that either. I was like, hey, bro, I didn't know none of that. <laughs> like, yeah. I was focused. I was focused on DJ Shockley and everybody. Else that, bro. And DJ a legend too, bro. He don't get Man. his credit. <laughs> yeah, and I, and I and I met when I was covering the Falcons. I met DJ. I met mm -hmm. DJ when I was covering the Falcons. I met DJ and I met. I've, I've talked to DJ a couple of times. Um, and of course, now that he works with the SEC Network, I mm -hmm. see him covering. Well, last year I saw him covering um, Tennessee games. So, yeah, man. It, I mean, I'm just doing my job. Like I said, I do my job. I do. A, I cover every team fairly. You know, I don't provide any commentary unless I am asked to. But other than that, yeah, I'm just. I just cover the team fairly. That's that's how, that's what you're supposed to do. I cover Georgia State the same way. Yes, sir. I didn't. I didn't just go hard and try to defend Georgia State. If Georgia State was playing like trash, I, I was going like Georgia State is not playing well, bro. Like, yeah. They are playing garbage right now. They're giving up way too many yards. They're doing this. They're doing that. Like, come on, man. Georgia State had two good seasons when I was there and two really bad ones. Mm -hmm. Two really, really bad ones, bro. Like, when I first got here, Georgia State was – they were all right, but then they turned it on at the end of the season. They beat, they beat up on Southern, went to the bowl game, and lost the bowl game, which sucked. Mm -hmm. But it happened. Yeah. The year after that. Man, they were garbage. You know what I mean? You know, um, what's his name? Um, Coach Miles got fired. Yeah, like, Trent Miles, bad. yeah. Yeah, Trent Miles got fired. And I was like, man, this is like, this team was not good. I think they they finished that year like, what was it, like three and nine? Yeah, I was about to say, I think they only won two games probably. Yeah, it was, it, was, it was something like that. Like, it was, yeah. was kind of ugly, man. Um, and then the year after, Sean Elliott get here, and they, they was pretty good, bro. They messed around, went to the bowl game, and that was <laughs> I was like, hey, and then they won. Yeah. Like, yo, these, I was like, these cats for real. So that happened. And then my last season with Dan Ellington, they go two and eight. Or whatever. Yeah, they went two and eight. Something like that. They won two games. And Southern killed them. Like Southern whooped them bad, bro. <laughs> so I mean, I I've I've and, and every single time I covered them, I covered them fairly. It was just like this is this is what happened. You know? So I'm I'm not gonna do any different. I don't care if I'm covering Tennessee. Florida, Georgia, Bama, you know what I'm saying? Um, like, the only teams I would not cover fairly would be the Saints. Mm, yeah. yeah, you don't I rock would, with the Saints either. <laughs> yeah, it was like, I would never cover the Saints fairly. Like, you would yeah. know I don't – you would know I don't like them. You would know. <laughs> and and like, y'all would run me out of town. I'll be, I'll be smiling when y'all lose. I'll be <laughs> mad when y'all win, man. Like, <laughs> but, hey, you already know, bro. I'm with it. Yeah. David, man, you talking about keeping it professional. That's something mm -hmm. that's so big to me. How do you make sure that you maintain a high level of professionalism? And two, a lot of people are scared of the camera, even journalists. Like, a lot of people don't know that. Sometimes when those lights and that camera comes on, some people right. freeze. How do you stay confident? And two, how do you stay professional? Man, I always just – well, being a professional, I think you just you just know a line. There's a line of, okay, this is what you can do, this is what you can't. Mm -hmm. And that comes with me. Like I said, I went to camps and all this kind of stuff. So that stuff was implanted in me very, very early it was preached to me very, very early. So I, I kind of understood that off rip. It was kind of like, mm -hmm. all right, this is what you do when you are covering a game, and this is what you do not do because it's going to come across bad and it's going to mess your whole career up. 
You know what I mean? You may, you, so just, just because you covered this little small little college and you was talking about, <laughs> we did this, we did that. Like, what did you do? You ain't do nothing but stand on the sideline, bro. Mm. So if I'm saying we, if you notice, I never, ever, you can go back through every episode of Primetime. I might've said we by accident once. Wow, that's a good point. I never thought about that. Every time I said Georgia State, Georgia State, Georgia State, the Panthers, the Panthers, the Panthers, the Panthers. I never, mm. just, I never said, I never said we did this, we did that. It was always Georgia State, Georgia State, Georgia State, or the Panthers, the Panthers, because I'm not gonna get wherever. Because I said wherever I go, I don't want them thinking that I'm gonna fall in love with the team and, mm. imme and immediately be like we, 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 we. You know what I'm saying? Because with Tennessee, I don't call them. I don't say we. I don't say us. I say the Vols or Tennessee or UT. Mm. That's what I say. I don't. Say, I don't say we anything. Even when I was at Georgia State, I didn't say we. I said Georgia State. I, I know I was a student. I was like, I'm a student here. I go here. I know that. But as a reporter, you are completely like objective. You're supposed to be in the middle and understand it's it's a human thing to have an opinion. But when you're reporting, you just keep those out the story. So you got to be able to filter those out. So I understood that. And then, you know, when it comes to the camera, I mean, look, that's just something that's just got to be in you. Like, you can't mm -hmm. be scared. Of, you can't be scared of the camera. can't be scared of the red light. Some people are and some people aren't. Um, mm -hmm. But that's, that's something that's within you. I always feel like there's like a few people watching. I never think about it like, oh, I work at the number one station here in Tennessee. Like, a lot of people do watch us. A lot of people do watch it. I always think it's like, oh, it's like 10 people. <laughs> That's what I think, um, even though it's way more. Because if I get on there, I bet you if I got on there and I say, you know what, man, Tennessee is trash and da-da-da, I can't wait to get out of this town because I'm tired of covering this football team. I bet you we would get so many emails. I'd be like, oh, yeah. I would figure out how many people watch us. But <laughs> when mm -hmm. when I'm just talking and it's just like, you know, hey, you know, Tennessee's got this and this going on. Let's take a look at the running game and everything. Well, I mean, that's what I'm supposed to do. So I'm not causing, you know. And then at that time, I'm thinking, there's like five people watching, bro. And I'm not worried about it. You know what I mean? I'm not I'm not worried about what's going yeah. on. About five people here. You never know who's watching. That's yeah, you, No, nah, you never know who's watching. Someone told me Marshall Falk had seen primetime once. And I was like, oh. You lying, bro. Nah, somebody said wow. Marshall Falk watched the show. And this was like my first or second year there. And I didn't know nothing about it. I never, wow. And I've never met Marshall Falk. So I never got a chance to actually know if that actually happened or not. Yeah. It was just like Marshall Falk said he's seen the show and he really likes it. I was like, I ain't never met Marshall Falk. <laughs> but you never know who's watching, bro. That's facts. David, man, my second to last question. Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't know that you write as well. I remember in class, yeah. you would do write up super fast, covering yeah. the Falcons. And also, you were excellent on camera. What's the importance of young journalists knowing, yo, just like how you want to be on camera, you need to know how to write as well? Man, I'm glad you brought that up because the foundation is writing. Writing mm -hmm. is the foundation for everything we do in journalism, whether you are on camera or behind yep. it. If yep. you are a producer, you write the entire show. You know what I mean? If you're a digital person, you're writing the articles for the website. Um, as a sports person, guess what? We do everything, bro. I, I write my own sports cast. I put stuff on the internet and I got to perform on, on the camera. Mm. I do, I do everything, bro. I do everything. So, um, yeah, it's just, it's just one of those things where, um, writing really shows up in everything you do. And if you're not a good writer, it will be known and you're going to have to get better at it. Yeah. And the first thing I did in journalism was not on camera. The first thing I did in journalism was writing. I mm -hmm. wasn't, when it comes to journalism, bro, I was not on camera for a long time. I wow. was doing, I did, I did writing and radio. I did. The first things I did was writing and radio. The first, my first accomplishment in journalism was having an article I wrote appear in the newspaper. Yeah, I feel that. that. Was, I was there too, that bro. Was my, yeah, that was my first accomplishment. It was yeah. my name on the byline. My first yeah. accomplishment was not anything on camera. Mm. So I'm glad you say that. Writing is the foundation for everything. So I yes. So when it comes to journalism, yeah, you, your writing needs to be good. Your writing needs to be on point. Um, because if it's not, it will show up, and your writing won't be. You know, how do how do you get creative? How do you you know how do you use your words? How do you make a script flow? Because some people don't know how to make a script flow. Transition. They just, yeah, they just they just yeah. talking. They don't really know how to yeah. go from one thing to the next. They don't know how yeah. to you know go from here to here to here. So 
Yeah, that's, I'm glad you brought that up. Writing, yeah, writing's the most important thing. That's fact. Shout out to my man Giovanni, who was recently on the show. Uh, Giovanni, mm -hmm. he asked, how do you remain objective in reporting without falling into industry biases pertaining to certain narratives? That's a good question. Yeah, well, I think it's just all about, you know, keeping keeping your your head above water and knowing that you it, it's you got to play the long game. Like, if I'm sitting over here talking with all this bias now, who can what what sources could trust me? Hmm. What who who can who can trust me? I need I need people to to trust what I have to say. I need people to trust what I'm what I'm gonna report about uh, report about. If you can't trust that, then it's not good. So showing biases shows that you have an affinity for something, and someone who's on the other side of that's not gonna like it. Mm. You would be able to get both sides if there is a dispute between a coach and a player, imagine having the trust of both of them to where, you can, where you can, where I can call. So let's, let's take the Raiders mm. situation a year ago. I'm, let's say I'm cool with Antonio Brown and John Gruden. They both my boys, right? I trust that both of them trust me. And I say, all right, we all know what's going on. I want to know your side and I'm going to call Antonio and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask for his side. But if it looked like I have an affinity for, for Antonio Brown, or if I'm trying to, um, everybody was like, man, Antonio Brown's a, he's a hothead, da, 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 and I'm doing the same thing, just spewing out all these opinions, like, man, he a hothead, he don't know what he's doing. Imagine, imagine if, if I'm trying to be like, hey, man, Antonio, I just, you know, want to see if you want to do an interview. He was like, bro, you was just talking all that stuff about me, man. Skip Bayless how, type. Yeah. Right, like, how, how could yeah. I want to sit down and do an interview with you? You just, you slandered me, you know? Mm. So, I think, I think it's really about, all right, you know, it's kind of the long game. And, and it just sounds, it just doesn't sound like real reporting. It just sounds like uh, an editorial where you just mm. just going in and da 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 da. And our job is just to tell the story, not give our opinion on the story. Just tell the story and what's going on. Um, and that's that is that is our job. Period. That's all we need to do. And if we mm. do anything outside of that, then you're not really doing journalism. You're you're doing editorializing. Which there are jobs where you can do that. But my job is not one of those jobs. Mm. So that's that's how. It's just I'm just following instructions. Mm. Love that, bro. Sid said, preach. I see you, Sid. Oh yeah. <laughs> she I thought, man. I thought I heard I thought I heard her in the kitchen cooking. Bro. Oh, you already know. Hey, she was trying to cook up a little bit. <laughs> yeah, I was like, I was like, that might be sitting there, uh, in there yeah. cooking right now, bro. <laughs> hey Sid, man, she out there. I'm in the room, man. She tuned it in. <laughs> Man, Sealy, bro, again, I cannot tell you thank you enough, man, for your time. I know you're extremely busy. Man, my last question for you, mm -hmm. where do you see yourself within the next five to ten years? Man, um, you know, I never I, – I used to be able to answer that with so much confidence. Now I just – I can't really say for sure. Mm -hmm. um, I know. I tell you what, though. I do have, like, my plan. I always tell people to have their, their uh, plan of zeros, which is by 30, you want to be doing this. In 40, you want to be doing this. So 50, you know, 60, you have a plan. You put that in pen. What's in between those needs to be in pencil because it can change all the time. But mm -hmm. make sure by the time you get to 30, 40, 50, 60, you know, that this is what you're going to be doing that by that age. Mm -hmm. and everything that happens in between, you just never know, man. You never know what storms can come. You never know what circumstances circumstances could, could arise. So, you, you know, have that in pencil and just have that. So I know, so dang, I'm about to, I'm, I'm, just a couple months away from being 25. So I'm getting closer to 30 every day. Um, so by 30, I did say I wanted to be at a, um, at a network. I did already know that that's going to happen. Yeah. Bro. It's yeah gonna I just wanted to be at a network. So, yeah. um, you know, which network that is, I don't know, but I did know, like, I do know that I wanted to be at a network. Um, whether I'm just a reporter or I'm, I'm something, but I do know that in the next five to 10 years, I, I definitely want to say, Hey, I'm not in the local thing anymore. I'm on the national network. And the only way you can see me is on cable. Mm. The only way you can do it. Talk that talk, man. David, bro, your future, you already know, is so bright, man. Keep killing it, bro. For us, we love seeing you win, man. You just represent it, man, for all of us. So keep up the great work. And you already know, when you come back home to Atlanta, oh, yeah, and, up, and we got you. You already know, man. Why all the all these people coming in late, man? My girl came, uh, Cam came in here late. Sid came in here late. Get on CP. <laughs> everybody, time. everybody came in late, man. Cam, you done missed everything, but I, and I guess what, Cam? I was watching, I was watching Cam. I was watching Cam. Cam got a show, man. She played at Tennessee, 
she she just got like a she got a show now. Um, dope, dope, on, dope. On IG Live, man. I was watching that last night, bro. It was pretty good. So that's a little plug for her. Oh, I can plug myself real quick too. Yeah, hey, please um, do see me, please. Yeah, yeah, please. yeah. So obviously you can follow me on here, um, and then you can follow me on on Twitter under the same name, uh, Deacon underscore Sheely, and then uh, I got a YouTube channel. I got a gaming channel. Yes, hey, yeah. it's hilarious, man. It's yeah, I got hilarious. a guy. I got, I got a gaming channel. I know, man. People. <laughs> People be wondering what my personality is. It's on the game. If you turn on the game channel, I love you, can, it. you can find out. Like it's it's all right there. So <laughs> if you want to get me on YouTube, that's yeah. five wars deep. So that's um five and then wars and you spell out the word five. So spell out the word five wars and then deke is just D E A C, which is just the first half of, of my stage name, which is Deacon. So um yeah, five five wars deep. So that's that's all it is. Yeah, black people are always late. You're right, Cam. <laughs> my god bro and look giovanni he said seely you are needed our community is in critical need of our people in the media sphere that's, that's facts, facts. Bro. that's facts that's man facts. i had i had a guy a very a very famous former tennessee uh football player man he an act like he's a very known dude and i was on i got his contact i was on the phone with him and he said man he said when i played at tennessee there wasn't not one brother who came and talked to us from the local stations man he said they never had a brother wow that he was like, I didn't get interviewed by nobody, but that was a brother. Everybody, he was like, nobody, nobody came to the locker room or to the games that looked like me, man. He was like, what you doing is important. And that was one of the biggest boosts for me. Like, I was like, yo, okay. Like, you know, I and, and I knew, I knew there wasn't going to be a lot of people that, that looked like me in, in Knoxville. I knew that. But to hear that from somebody who played, like, no, 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 like, yeah, it may not be celebrated. It may not be a parade or anything, but just know, yes, it's important. It's important. That representation does matter. And even the people that haven't been at Tennessee in decades, it still matters. So doing that, you know, winning, winning sports caster of the year as a rookie that, you know what I mean? Those yes, bro. Important. Shout out to you, bro, for that. I yeah. forgot about that. Yeah. Ooh. I won, I won Tennessee sports caster of the year as a rookie. And I think, I was told I was told that I was the first black man to win that award. I don't mm. know if that's I don't know if that's actually a fact. Black but history, Sealy, baby. Yeah, I was. Like, I don't know. <laughs> I, I might have made black history in the state. Yeah. That might be true. That I don't know. I haven't done I haven't done the full research to see if I was the first black person. But I I do believe I am the first rookie. I do believe that though. I think I am. So this yeah, it's it's some it's some stuff out here, man. Like it get kind of crazy. You got it's not it's Knoxville, Tennessee. You just say the name, people be like, "You live there." <laughs> so, yeah. Hey, I ain't yeah. even gonna get you in trouble. You ain't gotta say nothing else. Yeah, man. I catch a drift. <laughs> Sealy, man, again, thank you for your time, for that wealth of knowledge that you gave us. It was needed, and for everybody who came in late, it's all good. This will be posted on YouTube very soon, probably uh, this weekend. I got y'all, but David, man, thank you for your time again, bro. And we cannot wait to see you soon, man. Much love. Show, man. I appreciate it, bro. All love, brother. All love. Yes, sir. Enjoy your night, bro. All right, man. You do the same.